Hi everyone, it's me, Arielle, and I'd like to do a video today regarding family dynamics. And it's for those who are struggling with an eating disorder, but it's also for the family members of the person who's struggling with an eating disorder. And um, I think a lot of the time people who have an eating disorder feel very misunderstood. And more than that, they feel very alone. And it's a really hard thing to feel alone in your own house with the people that you love the most. People have asked me for advice on family members who can't accept or understand eating disorders. I think it's very important to remember that someone who does not have an eating disorder may never fully understand an eating disorder. So to ask someone to understand is a very, very tall order. And it may not mean that the person is not understanding. It just may mean that they don't have the capacity to really understand what it means to struggle with something so drastic. And I think uh, if, you can, if you can realize and come to terms with the fact that the people you love and care about most may never really understand your disease, then you can go from there and at least get support and at least get acceptance and stability and a certain element of compassion because I think compassion sometimes is different from understanding and people confuse the two and certainly it would be wonderful if everyone out there in the world could understand what it's like to live with an eating disorder but we know that that's not logical and realistic. There are a lot of different people in our lives that may fit this role of a person we love who can't understand us and who can't accept our eating disorders and who can't support us the way we wish they would support us. It can be a roommate, it can be a best friend, it can be a significant other, meaning a spouse, a boyfriend, a girlfriend. Um, it can be a child who is still living at home. It can be an adult child. It can be a grandparent. It can be another kind of a relative. It can be a teacher. It can be so many people to us that we just wish would understand and they can't. I wrote something back in April of 2011, and it was called Friendship, Eating Disorders, and Everyone's Right to Lead a Life. And it was in response to someone who had sent me quite a long letter about her best friend. And I'm going to link you to the blog post that I did about this, because in this post, I discuss that the person struggling with an eating disorder in recovery has the right to lead her life and do what she needs to do and be allowed, have permission to make mistakes and move at her own pace. And then the other person in her life has the right to say, I can't deal with that and move on. And if that means that two people are at an impasse, then unfortunately that might be what it means. If it means that um, people need space from each other and time, that might be the case as well. It might mean that um, the, the two can come to a compromise. It also might mean that more communication is necessary to get the results that each person is looking for. And sometimes it's really just about having a conversation. But I do encourage you to uh, check out that blog post. It is a little bit long, but it's because half of the post is the letter from the person so that you know exactly what I'm responding to. And then my response is, is fairly direct. And I do use an analogy that I think a lot of people can better understand when we're discussing eating disorders. I did a video a couple of years ago about helpful support and it was directed towards loved ones of the eating disordered individual so that um, they knew what helpful support really was and what constituted something that's helpful versus something that they might really want to say or really get across or use their opinion. Um, and I did another video even longer ago um, that was called Advice for a Friend of an Eating Disorder Sufferer. And that one was targeted, again, more at a friend than a family member, but there are some good things that can be gleaned from those videos, so I invite you to check those out if you're interested. I 
think what frustrates family members so much is that they think the person who is struggling with an eating disorder can control it. They think that if they just put their mind to it, they could eat what they were supposed to eat, they could eat when they were supposed to eat, they could eat the right amounts, and they wouldn't have any trouble. And they think it's a sort of a mind over matter. But it's really easy to say and really difficult to do because an eating disorder is a mental illness. It's not something that someone chooses. It's not the same as, say, deciding one day that you were going to smoke and smoking cigarettes and then having a really, really difficult time quitting because your body has become addicted to the nicotine. It's not the same thing. And people often want to look at it the same way. You didn't choose one day to go down the path of an eating disorder. There may have been some conscious decisions that a person struggling with an eating disorder has made, and they may have made some poor choices, and they may have had control over certain aspects of their disorder, but it is a mental illness, and there is uh, predisposition involved, there's genetics involved, there are social, environmental factors involved. There are so many factors, depending on the individual, depending upon the eating disorder, and it's very unfair to put all of it on that person who's struggling with an eating disorder and say, you could change if you really want to. So if you can't understand an eating disorder because you don't have one and it's very difficult to understand, then at least understand that. At least understand that it's a mental illness and there's no choice involved. And it's very, very hard to recover from an eating disorder. Is it possible? It is, because I'm sitting here in front of you having been fully recovered for several years now, but it is a very long journey. And sometimes there are a lot of pitfalls and there are a lot of hardships and there are a lot of setbacks. and. It can be a strain on the family, but it can also be a strain on the person, especially when the battle has been going on for so long. And when I'm sitting here talking to you about family dynamics and the way family members might feel, I am coming from the point of view of the anorexic daughter because I saw, you know, how it affected my parents and I saw how it affected my friends and I know what it must be like at least witnessing that to have to internalize all of that pain and to not be able to change what's going on to this person that you care about and to essentially feel helpless. And I think that's the number one word that comes to mind when I think of family members who think that the person they care about with an eating disorder can control it and they wish that they could just get better already. Why is it taking so long? It's that word helplessness. They feel helpless. They're powerless to do anything and they just feel like they can't stand by and watch it keep happening. But that's not what I'm asking you to do. I'm not asking you to stand by and watch it keep happening. Um, you may feel helpless in many aspects of your loved one's eating disorder, but you're not entirely helpless because if you can show that unconditional support that they're longing for, even if you can't understand the eating disorder itself, you're giving something to them and you are not being helpless because if you weren't giving your unconditional support and love, then they would be lacking even more than they're already lacking. And I think that's really important to remember too. There are some really good links for families, and I'm going to post the links to those in the info box to this video. I really hope you'll check them out. A lot of them are targeted at parents of teenage children with eating disorders. That is where there is a plethora of advice and resources and tools, but certainly when we're talking about a family, it can be a parent that has the eating disorder, or it can be a spouse that has the eating disorder and the other spouse is trying to support and handle it. And it's a hard road for both people involved or for all people involved, but 
it can be done and the person who's struggling can come out on top, but you have to have faith in them instead of judging them. And you have to believe that they can do it without making them feel bad for not having gotten to the point you wish they were at yet. And I think sometimes just asking, what can I do? You know, today you seem like this, or today you seem, is there anything that I can do? And sometimes the person who has an eating disorder might say, no, there's nothing you can do. I'm just having a horrible day. Sometimes they might stop and think, and they might come back to you later and say, yeah, it might help if we did this, or if you said this, or if we took 10 minutes and talked about this. Sometimes they might just jump at the chance as soon as you ask them that question, and they might say, yeah, this would help. And it can be a really small thing, so you might be surprised at the answer, but the, the thing to remember is that you have to do it. You have to remember to ask, is there anything I can do? And, um, you know, you don't have to be the eating disordered person's therapist. That's not your job. It's just a matter of being a family support and being there for the person. And if that's what you want to be, then that's the first step, asking. One of the most confusing things about watching a loved one with an eating disorder is that sometimes they seem so in control and sometimes they seem completely out of control. So it would then stand to reason that they could have control if they wanted to, but it doesn't work that way. And I know that is a silly short answer that has no explanation, but again, eating disorders are mental illnesses. I just want to read you something about what an eating disorder is, and it's from the NIDA website, which is the National Eating Disorders Association. Eating disorders include extreme emotions, attitudes, and behaviors surrounding weight and food issues. Eating disorders are serious emotional and physical problems that can have life-threatening consequences for females and males. Eating disorders refer to a group of conditions defined by abnormal eating habits that may involve either insufficient or excessive food intake to the detriment of an individual's physical and mental health. The precise cause of eating disorders is not entirely understood, but there is evidence that it may be linked to other medical conditions and situations. Research shows that for some people there is a genetic reason why they may be prone to developing an eating disorder. Eating disorders are classified as Axis I disorders in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Health Disorders, which we typically know as the DSM. There are various other psychological issues that may factor into eating disorders. I want to still drive home the point that eating disorders are not chosen and they are in fact mental illnesses. If someone you know had schizophrenia, you would find it very difficult to deal with, perhaps, if you were their family member. Um, you would feel helpless at times, and you would be worried, and you would be concerned, and you would have some internal struggles, but you wouldn't think to yourself, just stop being schizophrenic. You can control this if you want to control it. If you want to eat, you can eat. Or if you don't want to binge, you don't have to binge. You wouldn't think that black and white if you were talking about someone with another mental illness, just using schizophrenia as an example. So please really try to remember that eating disorders are mental illnesses. Now there are some choices that can be made and one of those is the choice to recover. People who have eating disorders can choose recovery or not choose recovery. But the important thing to remember is that recovery is a long journey. It takes longer for some people than other people. Sometimes there are relapses. Sometimes people are doing really well for a long period of time and they relapse and they have to start the recovery journey again. And it's extremely hard to go through that if you're the eating disordered person. So as much patience and support and love as you can muster as a family member is vital. I understand that it can be very worrying to hear and see and live with someone who is struggling with an eating disorder. As an eating disorder support group leader and someone who works with eating disordered individuals regularly, 
I know how easy it is to internalize their stories and their pain. And I know how easy it is to deal with those emotions. So as a family member of someone who's struggling with an eating disorder, if you feel that the person is not doing what they need to do, or you are angry or frustrated, your feelings are valid too. The person who has an eating disorder does not have feelings that are more valid than yours. All feelings are equally valid. But if you're struggling with those emotions like frustration and anger, it's really best to go and take care of yourself and do the things that you need to do and experience those emotions and make yourself feel better and take care of yourself first instead of lashing out at the person who's making you feel that way. You're allowed to feel those feelings, but rather than express your anger and frustration at the person, you may do better to say, okay, I can't deal with this right now. What I need to do is take care of myself and leave the situation. That way you're not throwing out accusations and hurtful things at the person who already has a lot on their plate and you are still being supportive because in leaving you are keeping yourself at your best self and you'll be able to be a better support later when your mind is clearer. Certainly if you feel that you can't be a support 24-7 that's human. That's fine. And I don't think that most people with eating disorders expect their family members to be fully supportive 100% of the time without fail or breath. Like saying why. Um, it's never a good idea to phrase things with a why because it sounds judgmental. Um, you can ask about the eating disorder in ways that aren't saying, why are you doing this? And well, why are you doing that? One thing I would encourage for anyone who has a loved one with an eating disorder is to call the ANAD hotline. And ANAD stands for Anorexia Nervosa and Associated Disorders. You can call the hotline and talk to someone who can talk to you about your situation. So if you have questions about what your loved one is doing or why you're reacting the way you're reacting, you can talk freely to a person who is objective. And the other thing you can do um, as far as contacting ANAD is you can send an email. They have a Facebook page, they have a Twitter page, they have an email account, and people are very good about getting back to you. And I think that for anyone who knows someone struggling with an eating disorder, certainly they're a really good place to reach out. I'm going to post the link to ANAD's website. They have a slew of resources. Sometimes I think it just makes family members feel a lot better to go to that site, see what's there, understand that they're not the only family who is dealing with someone who has an eating disorder. They're not alone. And if they feel less alone, they can in turn make their loved one feel less alone by giving that important support um, non-judgmentally and unconditionally. One of the things that's on my website is something I've called Ariel's Mantra. And it's something I wrote a few years ago, probably four years ago. And um, it's primarily for people who are struggling with an eating disorder to remind them that recovery is possible and to remind them that there will be good days and bad days, but they can get through it. But I think it bears repeating for family members who have a loved one with an eating disorder because it does drive home the point that it's not simple and it's not an easy process. And again, there will be good days and bad days. So I'm going to quickly read that to you. That's how I'll leave you today. Recovery is possible. It's not a guarantee. It's a possibility. It's not simple. It is difficult and sometimes seems impossible. It's not a one-step process. It's a multi-step process complete with twists and turns and bending roads, and roads you didn't even know were there. It's not the same for everyone. It's not always a happy process. It's not always a sad process. It is empowering. It's not about pleasing other people. It's not about them. It's about you. It's not about perfection. 
It is about emotion. It is about honesty. It is about self-discovery and self-affirmation. It's not about what you don't have. It's about using what you've got. It's not about hiding. It's about finding and displaying. It's not a quick fix. It's a lifelong plan set into motion by truth and nurturing and self-love. It's not about external factors or environment. It is about what's within. It is not crazy. It is real. Recovery is possible. An eating disorder is not easy for anyone. It's not easy for the person who's dealing with it and living with it day to day. And it's not easy for the family members and friends who see the person they love struggling with it day to day. But recovery again is possible. And with the right support and the right mindset from everyone involved, the person who has the eating disorder has so much more of a chance of surviving and getting better and feeling loved. Thanks for watching.